Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day to those of you who, mothers, thank you for being with us today. Today we're continuing a series called The Church, and in this series, what we're trying to do is form a simple definition of the church together. And um, so here's our simple definition. Um, The church is a community of people who, and then we've got... uh, five things here. The church is a community of people who follow Jesus. I think this is going to be on the screen. Uh, The guy who's running slides today, it's his first time. And uh, he's a friend of mine. And I told him, don't mess up. And um, uh, so that's awesome. (laughs) Um, Anyway. Uh, Okay, here's the definition of the church that we were talking about. The church is a community of people who follow Jesus who gather for worship, who publicly profess our faith, who commit to each other, and who spread the gospel. Each week in this series, we're talking about one piece of this definition, and today we're talking about how the church is a community of people who publicly profess our faith. So today we're talking about what's called the ordinances, or baptism and the Lord's Supper. Um, And these are two symbols or two signs that Jesus gave to the church. And that's why we call them ordinances. The word ordinance just comes from the word ordain. So Jesus ordained these. Jesus picked these and said, you should do these two things. Um, And so that's why they're called um, ordinances. And these are symbols. And symbols are powerful. Symbols are powerful because they identify a people and they communicate a message. Symbols identify a people, and they communicate a message. Um, Think about a few different symbols that we have in our world today. Um, When I was in college, um, uh, think about a ring, okay? When I was in college, um, if a guy thought that a girl was attractive, um, then the next thing that he would do, and people would joke about this, is try to see if she had a ring on her finger. Um, why was that a thing? Because they wanted to know, is, is she already off limits, is how the guy was, was thinking about it. Because a ring communicates something. Just by seeing an engagement ring, you can identify someone as, oh, now I know something about them. It identifies the people and it communicates a message. The same is true for a wedding ring. This identifies me as married person. And it also communicates something. It's a reminder to me that I'm someone who took vows. And I need to be reminded to live according to those vows. A ring is a symbol. Think about that. This is just a normal thing. But in our culture, it goes on a finger and it means something. That's what a symbol does. Um, Symbols are all over the place in terms of logos in our world. Um, So a couple weeks ago, um, Courtney and some friends and I went to this UW baseball game. They were playing Stanford. And without thinking, I wore my Tennessee hat to the game. (laughs) And Courtney hated it. And she's like, what the heck? You live in Washington now. We're going to a Washington game. Um, But because I had on this orange hat with a T on it, I had conversations with people that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, So people, uh, yeah, uh, people identified me as someone and it communicated a message just by wearing a hat. Now think about that. Just a color and a design communicate something. That's a symbol. That's what symbols do. There are certain logos that would be offensive for us to even put on the screen just because of who they identify and what they communicate. Think about that. Literally just the way something's branded tells a story. Symbols are powerful. This is also true of uniforms a team might wear or that a referee might have on, or you can tell certain professions based on what they're wearing. Again, you see this thing and it symbolizes it communicates a message and identifies a people. Symbols are powerful. That's the point. And here's why we're talking about that. 
is Jesus has given two symbols to the church. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And these symbols are intended to communicate a message and identify a people because that's what symbols do. And so today what we're going to talk about is each of these two symbols and what they mean and then how that relates to the church. Okay? So we'll talk about each one separately and then we'll talk about how it relates to the church. That's the outline for today. Now, before we talk about each of them individually, let's uh, talk um, about both of them together real quick. Uh, In order to best understand baptism and the Lord's Supper, it's helpful to to know the overall story of what God is doing in the Bible. Ultimately, what God is doing in the Bible is this. He's gathering a people for himself. That's what he's doing. So this really gets kick-started in the book of Genesis with this man named Abraham. God comes to Abraham, he chooses Abraham, and he says, Abraham, your family is going to be my people. I'm going to bless your family, and through your family, all the nations of the earth, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through your family. So God was gathering a people for himself, and he was doing that through Abraham. Abraham. And when God made that promise to Abraham, he also gave him a symbol to help him remember that promise. And the symbol was circumcision. All of the men in Abraham's family were going to be circumcised as a reminder that when their family grows, it's a fulfillment of the promise that God gave to Abraham. So God made a promise. He was forming a people and he gave these, this people a symbol to remember that promise. He does the same thing through Moses. Abraham's family grows. They become this huge nation, and then they end up as slaves in Egypt. And then God remembers his promise with Abraham, and he sends Moses to rescue the people out of slavery in Egypt and to form a new nation in a new land. And so God saves them. The way that he saves them is commemorated in this event called the Passover. And the Passover became a national meal that they were to have once a year. And it was a symbol of how God had saved them from slavery in Egypt. And so once a year, they were to eat this meal and each part of the meal represented something about their time in Egypt and the meal as a whole reminded them that they had been saved from Egypt. So that's the story of the Old Testament. The rest of the Old Testament from that point is looking back on those two things, the promise to Abraham and what God did by rescuing them from Egypt through Moses. It's looking back on those things and saying, live in light of that. That's the Old Testament. Jesus shows up on the earth and claims that he has come to finish the work that God started with Abraham and Moses. Jesus came to finish that work. Jesus came to expand the family of Abraham to include all of those who have faith in God's promises. And Jesus came to rescue a new nation out of slavery by the blood of a lamb. So Jesus has come to finish the work that God started with Abraham and with Moses. And so because Jesus has come to do that, and that all culminates in Jesus's death and his resurrection, then following the pattern that God set in the Old Testament, Jesus gives some symbols to help us remember the promises that God has made. In the Old Testament, what were those symbols? Circumcision, Passover. In the New Testament, God gives some symbols through Jesus, baptism and the Lord's Supper. In the Old Testament, God's people were identified by circumcision. In the New Testament, God's people are identified by baptism. In the Old Testament, God's people remembered God's salvation through the Passover meal. In the New Testament, God's people remember God's salvation through the Lord's Supper. So, 
With that in mind as background, let's talk about each one of these two symbols. Does that make sense so far? All right. Baptism. What is baptism? Well, the word baptism or baptize just means to wash. That's all it means. So in the New Testament, the word wash applies. The word baptize refers to washing dishes or washing your hands before you eat. And it comes to take on a special meaning when referring to baptism as we think of it. But the word baptize just means to wash. And baptism becomes a specific ritual, a specific symbol, because Jesus told his followers to baptize. That's the only reason that we do it, as Jesus said to do it. So Matthew chapter 28, this is called the Great Commission. This is where Jesus gives the marching orders to his followers before he ascends to be with his father. And here's what he says. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So baptism is a symbolic washing. And why do we do it? Because Jesus said to do it. That's why we do it. Um, The question is, if this is a symbolic washing and symbols identify people and communicate a message, who does baptism identify? And what message does it communicate? So let's talk about those things. Who does baptism identify? Or another way of asking this question is, who is baptism for? Who should get baptized? The answer from Matthew 28 is disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Who's the them? Disciples. A disciple is just somebody who follows Jesus, who believes in Jesus, who wants to follow Jesus's way in the world. So that is who is supposed to be baptized, is people who believe in Jesus and want to follow Jesus. And this is the pattern of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is giving the first Christian sermon, and he's talking to a bunch of people who were actually responsible for crucifying Jesus. And he's talking to them, and he's like, you remember Jesus that you guys killed, right? Well, now he's actually been raised from the dead. And so now, because he's been raised from the dead, God is proving to everyone he really is the Messiah. He really is the one who has come into the world to save sinners. And so here's what you need to do. You need to say you're sorry. That is, you need to repent. And you need to be baptized. Here's what happens. He's given this message. Acts chapter 2. When they heard this, when this huge crowd hears this message about Jesus and his crucifixion and his resurrection... When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Skip into verse 41. So those who accepted his message were baptized. Who was baptized? Those who accepted the message, those who heard the news about Jesus and his death and his resurrection, and those who accepted it, that is, those who believed it, were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. So this is the pattern, that you hear the, the message about Jesus and his death and his resurrection, you believe it, and then you get baptized. This ha- happens again in Acts chapter 8, verse 12. Philip is preaching and it says, but when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Acts chapter eight, verse 12. Same thing happens in Acts chapter 10 and chapter 16 that happens in Acts chapter eight, verse 12. So baptism in the New Testament is for those who have trusted in Jesus and The assumption in the New Testament is that everyone who belongs to Jesus is baptized. Throughout the New Testament, the writers will talk to whole churches and be able to assume that if you belong to the church, you've been baptized. And if you've been baptized, you must have faith in Jesus. The two things are interchangeable. 
in the New Testament. Here's one example of that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul is writing to a whole church and he says, when you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now, this verse, we don't have time to make it. The whole thing makes sense. All I'm trying to show you in this one verse is this, that Paul can talk to these people and say, when you were baptized, he can assume that the whole group was baptized and he can say that you were also people who were exercising faith. Why? Because he's assuming that if you're in the church and you belong to Jesus, you've been baptized. And if you've been baptized, well, that means you must have faith. If you have faith, you must be baptized, vice versa. This has led a number of New Testament scholars to conclude that baptism is a shorthand in the New Testament for becoming a Christian. So when the New Testament says, and you were baptized into Christ Jesus, it's just referring to the entire process of becoming a Christian. To become a Christian, you repent of your sins, you believe in the gospel, you are born again, you receive the Holy Spirit. And baptism is just a simple way of being able to capture all of that stuff. It's shorthand for becoming a Christian. And so, to mention any one of those things, repentance, faith, etc., is to imply the rest. And baptism captures all of it. So, what's the point that we're trying to make? Here it is. Baptism is a symbol. Symbols identify people. Who does baptism identify? It identifies people who follow Jesus. Those who are baptized are people who have faith in Jesus, who follow Jesus. And those who have faith in Jesus and follow Jesus, you should expect, are baptized. That's the point. What about people who don't get baptized? And I know in a room this size, there's got to be a few rule breakers who are like, yeah, but do we have to? Because, and first of all, why do you got to be like that? Um, But second of all, uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Obviously, there are some exceptions to this rule, to this pattern, that those who have faith are baptized, and those who are baptized, you can expect to have faith. Obviously, there are some exceptions. Um, The thief on the cross is kind of the classic example. He's dying next to Jesus. Jesus says, you're going to be with me today in paradise. They don't like pause the crucifixion to baptize him to make sure that that will work out. He just can trust what Jesus said. So there are some exceptions, but the regular pattern is that followers of Jesus are baptized. To talk about someone being baptized, to talk about somebody being a Christian and vice versa. One scholar says, if someone has faith, but no access to baptism, one has Christ. But on the other hand, if one has baptism, but has no faith, one has nothing. If you've got baptism, I've been baptized but you don't actually have faith in Christ, you've got nothing. But on the other hand, if you've got faith in Christ, but you haven't been baptized, you've still got faith in Christ. You still got everything. But then why should you get baptized? Well, why should we obey God now that we've been saved from our sins? Shouldn't we just go on sinning so that grace can abound? By no means. it should be expected that followers of Jesus are baptized and that those who are baptized are followers of Jesus. That's the point. That's who baptism identifies. It's a symbol. What message does it communicate? Well, baptism communicates the gospel and the effects of the gospel. The word gospel just means good news. It refers to the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. Because Jesus died and was raised, sinners can be forgiven. Sinners like us can be right before God because Jesus died and was raised. That's what the gospel is. And baptism 
communicates that message. When somebody goes under the water, it's a picture of somebody dying. And when somebody comes out of the water, it's a picture of someone being raised. And who has died and risen so that we can have life, so that we can be forgiven? Jesus. So baptism itself is a picture of the gospel. When somebody goes under the water, it's reminding us Jesus died for sinners. When somebody comes out of the water, it's reminding us Jesus lives. And so baptism communicates the gospel message. It also communicates the effects or the power of the gospel. When someone goes under the water and comes out, now they're clean. Generally, that's how baths work. (laughs) The reason that you take a bath is to get clean. And baptism just means to wash. So baptism is a symbolic washing. It's a symbolic thing that we're doing. It's a symbol that's saying, this person has been washed. This person has been made clean. This person has been forgiven of their sins. On what basis? On the basis that they are identifying with the death of Jesus and identifying with the resurrection of Jesus. They are saying by getting baptized, I believe that Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection can make me clean. Do you have dirty thoughts? Do you have dirty habits? Baptism is a picture, a symbol that says to you, regardless of how filthy you are, you can be made clean. Not because of how great you are, not because of the actual ritual itself. Instead, baptism is a symbol that says, no matter how filthy you are, you can be made clean because Jesus has died and was raised for you. That's what baptism says. Baptism is announcing that every single time. And baptism is also announcing that not only can I be clean in the sense that I'm free from my past sins, but I can be clean in the sense that just as Jesus died and was raised, so we too have died with him and have been made new. We are new creatures, new creations, new people through our faith in him. We have a new power now. We have a new authority now. You do not have to say yes to sin anymore. Instead, you can say yes to God. You can live in a new way as a new person because of what Jesus has done for you. Baptism announces that. So, what is baptism? Baptism is a symbol. It's a symbol that identifies us with Jesus. It identifies us with Jesus's people. To get baptized is to say, I've got the Jesus ring on now. I'm associated with Jesus and with his people. To get baptized is to identify with his people and it's to proclaim, to announce his message. That forgiveness and new life is possible through the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what baptism is. So faith is a very personal thing, but it is never meant to be a private thing. Baptism is where our invisible faith becomes visible. It's where our invisible faith gets professed publicly. It's where we identify ourselves with Jesus. So, baptism is like circumcision in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the symbol that you had to take if you were going to enter the community and announce that you belonged to the people of God was to get circumcised. 
Now, baptism is the symbol that brings you into the community of faith. It's the mark that sets you apart as belonging to Jesus and his people. In this sense, baptism is like a jersey. You're on the team now. You've got a jersey that you can wear now. And if baptism is like the jersey, then the Lord's Supper is like coming to practice and playing the game. The Lord's Supper is also a symbol, but it's not the symbol that makes you part of the community. That's what baptism does. Baptism initiates you into the community. The Lord's Supper helps us remember the faith that we professed in our baptism. So let's talk about the Lord's Supper. The most um, concentrated place in the New Testament that talks about the Lord's Supper is the book of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, here's a helpful summary of the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the Lord's Supper is also a symbol. It identifies a people and it announces, it communicates a message. Let's talk about the message that it's communicating. This is a message in the Lord's Supper that points backwards and points forwards. The Lord's Supper points back and forward. It points back to something that Jesus has done, and it points forward to something that Jesus will do. It points back to the cross. Jesus says, this is my body. The bread is a symbol of Jesus's body. The cup is a symbol of Jesus's blood. Jesus took on flesh and became a human. He grew up and lived a sinless life, and then he went to a cross and he died on the cross. His body was nailed to a cross and his blood flowed out. And in Jesus's death, he made it possible for the worst of sinners to be made right with God. That is the event that the Lord's Supper looks back to. When we take the bread and the cup, we are reminding ourselves of what Jesus has done. It's a symbol that points back. And when we eat the supper, we're telling ourselves and we're telling the people around us that I believe I need what Jesus has done in his death on the cross. I need Jesus crucified in order for me to have life. That's what we're communicating. As you take the bread and you put it in your mouth and as you take the cup and you bring it to your mouth, that's what you're professing. You're saying, I need Jesus in his death. And you're not just saying that to yourself. The Lord's Supper is not something that you just do by yourself at home, like in the bathroom. It's like a secret thing that you've got going. It's something we do together. It's in public. It's visible. So it points backwards to his death, but it also points forward. Notice again the end of verse 26. Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Even in the Lord's Supper, 
We're proclaiming something that is to come. What is to come? The Lord's Supper is a symbol that points forward to a future meal that we will eat. If you've ever been kind of disappointed by the Lord's Supper, it's like Jesus has a supper and here's the supper that he decided to put together. It's pretty lame. If you've ever had those thoughts before, like this is it, that's because it's a symbol and it's pointing to a future meal that is not lame. In the book of Revelation, just before Jesus returns, like literally the verses right before he returns, here's what happens. Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, this huge group of people from all nations. It was like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder saying, hallelujah, because our Lord God, the almighty reigns. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory. And here's why. Because the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, write, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the lamb. He also said to me, these words of God are true. What is happening here? The event of Jesus returning to the earth is being described like a big wedding. And God has catered the wedding. It's called the marriage feast of the lamb. Jesus is the great husband who is returning to the earth He's coming to marry his bride. And the church, the community of people who belong to Jesus is the bride. And there is going to be a great feast when Jesus returns. And this feast is being pointed to when we take the Lord's Supper. When we take the Lord's Supper, we're reminding ourselves that not only has Jesus died, but Jesus will return. And when he returns, we will feast and weep no more. In this life, even as you eat the Lord's Supper and you reflect on what Jesus has done, you still face all kinds of problems. You still have all kinds of difficulties. You still are responsible for a bunch of messed up stuff in the world, and you still have to endure a bunch of messed up stuff that you can't control in the world. So looking back is great. It reminds you that you can stand before God, that you have new life because of what Jesus has done. But looking forward is also important. There is a day coming when we will feast and weep no more. This meal will be a meal like no other. And it will happen when Jesus returns. Sandra McCracken reflects on this in a song. And the chorus says, we will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things, we will say together. We will feast and weep no more. When we take the supper, we are publicly professing what Jesus will do when he comes. So the supper is a way of reminding ourselves and reminding each other of God's salvation. Just like the Passover in the Old Testament reminded people of how God rescued a nation out of slavery by the blood of a lamb, the Lord's Supper reminds God's people today how God has rescued a people out of slavery by the blood of a lamb. That's what the Lord's Supper communicates. But the Lord's Supper is not just a me and God thing. It's also a me and you thing. 
And one of the main reasons that Paul had to write about the Lord's Supper in the book of 1 Corinthians is because they were doing it wrong. And the way that they were doing it wrong is they were creating division at the table. Wealthy people got to eat at one time and poor people had to eat at a different time. And they weren't caring for one another. And they were rejoicing in how we're all made right with God. Oh, but we've all got all kinds of problems with each other, but eh, we won't deal with that. Um, Let's just rejoice that we're all connected to God through faith in Jesus. And Paul says, when you do that, when you allow divisions and you allow sins to go uncorrected between you, when there's not forgiveness and reconciliation between you, and when you're looking down on one another and not loving one another at the table, it's not even the Lord's Supper that you're eating. In other words, it's like you don't even get credit for taking the Lord's Supper when you get together that way, because it's not, that's not the point of the Lord's Supper. You, you're destroying the symbol, Paul's saying. And so here's what he says. It's kind of a long argument, so I'm trying to give you a snapshot of it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? He's saying, when we eat the bread and drink the cup, is it not a way of us reminding ourselves about Jesus and what he's done? Is it not a way of participating with Jesus? Then he says, verse 17, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, since all of us share the one bread. Now, this is worth meditating on. To meditate just means to think deeply about. It's worth going home and just thinking deeply about that verse. What is he saying? One of the things I think that he's saying, there's a lot of implications of that verse, but at least one of them, is because there's only one bread. The bread only represents one thing. That's the body of Christ. And since we are the body of Christ, then if we eat the Lord's Supper without thinking about the we of the supper, then we've done it wrong. Then he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 11, so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. We've got to consider the body when we eat. So at the Lord's Supper, we who are many come together as one at the table. Rich people and poor people both need the gospel. Every ethnicity needs the gospel. Men and women both need the gospel. Old people and middle-aged people and young people need the gospel. When we come to the table, it is a gospel-shaped community. The gospel is what brings us to the table. Pastor Bobby Jameson says, our vertical fellowship with Christ necessarily and inseparably creates a horizontal fellowship in the church. Because we have fellowship with Christ in the Lord's Supper, we also have fellowship with one another. And because the Lord's Supper is a covenant pledge to Christ, it is also implicitly a a covenant pledge to one another. So let's put all this together. What is the Lord's Supper? The Lord's Supper is where we remind ourselves about God's salvation. Eating the supper is publicly professing our faith in Christ and our commitment to his people. So the ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper are where faith goes public. 
We are identifying ourselves with Jesus and with his people. And we are tangibly proclaiming the gospel that saves us. In the ordinances, the community of faith becomes visible. In baptism, we put on the jersey. In the Lord's Supper, we come to the games. So, what implications does this have for the church? Let's talk about baptism, and then let's talk about the supper. With baptism, Christians should be baptized. If you're not baptized, but you do consider yourself a follower of Jesus, you don't need to feel any shame today. I do hope you feel compelled to obey Jesus and be baptized today. Baptism is how we visibly identify with Jesus and his people. Are there other ways to visibly identify with Jesus and his people? Yeah. But Jesus has specifically chosen baptism. And so it's a matter of obedience. Invisible faith is how we join God's family in heaven. But visible faith through baptism is how we make ourselves known to the family while we're on earth. And so, Christians should be baptized. Also, when someone is baptized, it's not just a commitment to follow Christ. It's also a commitment to join with his people. We're identifying with Jesus and with his people in baptism. So there's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. And so baptism is a means of publicly identifying with Jesus and it's a commitment to be with his people. This means when we as a church witness baptism, which we're about to do, when we witness baptisms, we should be rejoicing as the gospel is proclaimed. And we should be committing to love and disciple these people or participating in the church that exists to help equip and disciple these people. Here's what I mean. Many times um, for me growing up, it's like once somebody got baptized, it was like we were super excited and then like that was the end of our commitment to that person. You know, it's like, well, praise God, they finally got baptized, we did it. All right, who's next? Um, And baptism is not the end of our journey with this person. Baptism marks the beginning of us journeying with this person. Baptism is the jersey. It's the entryway into the community. It's, It's the sign, it's the symbol that says, oh yeah, these people are identifying with Jesus now. And so when we witness baptism, which we're about to do, we should pray for them and pray for our church that we would help disciple these people, that we would help these people continue to walk with Jesus. Those are some implications for baptism. Let's talk about the Lord's Supper. Before we take the Lord's Supper, we should should examine ourselves. And we're going to take the Lord's Supper together now. And so, if you would, would you take out your bread and cup? If you do not have one, there's some in the back that you can go grab. And we'll take this together in just a second. But go ahead and get it opened so that then you can focus. Because they're kind of difficult. Here we go. All right, as you get that going, take some time to examine yourself. Do you believe in Jesus? That's what eating and drinking the Lord's Supper says. Eating and drinking the Supper is announcing I believe in Jesus. Do you believe? Have you been baptized? If you've not been baptized, but you do believe in Jesus, you're welcome to take the supper today. But as a general practice, 
Baptism historically has come before taking the Lord's Supper because baptism is a symbol that marks off entering the community of faith. Whereas the Lord's Supper is a symbol that reminds us that we are in the covenant of faith, that we belong to Jesus. So even as you eat the supper, it can be an encouragement to be baptized if you have not. Before we take the supper, would you examine yourself and reflect on your relationship with God? Are there any ways that you're deliberately sinning against him now? Would you repent of those? Would you ask for his forgiveness? Not just because you promise never to do it again or something like that, but would you ask for his forgiveness on the basis of what you're about to eat? Before you take the supper, would you examine in your relationship with God, are you trusting him with critical areas of your life? Is there any area where he's calling you to obey and you need to trust him and obey? And before we take the Lord's Supper, we should reflect on our relationship with one another. So would you look up for a minute and would you just look around and make eye contact with some people? It'll feel awkward. That's okay. We are taking this meal together. There's one bread and one cup. And we as many are coming together as one. That's what Jesus accomplishes. And as you think about that, is there anybody that you've sinned against? Not only in this room, but is there anybody else that you need to seek forgiveness from? As you eat the Lord's Supper today, be reminded that, that we're called not just to reconciliation with God, but reconciliation with one another. Is there anybody that you need to offer forgiveness to? today. Just as we've been forgiven because of the death of Jesus, we are also to forgive. The Lord's Supper is a reminder that that is what is expected of God's people. That's what it means to be part of his community. So, what we're going to do now is take the Lord's Supper, and then we're going to witness three baptisms, I think three. And then let's remember what we're doing while we do these things. We're professing our faith in the gospel. And these have implications for us and God, but also for us and one another, and also for us and those who are being baptized. So, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We have just proclaimed the Lord's death 
until he comes. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for forming a people for yourself. Thank you for making us a people. Once we were not a people, but now we are. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have. And God, we know that that is only because of Jesus and his death and resurrection. We praise you for bringing us into your people. God, would you help us? Would you help us to live as your community ought so that the world can know what you're like? It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.